I'm, I want to speak uh, here in just a moment to uh, the issue of internet traffic and uh, how that's impacted, been impacted by the coronavirus, how it's impacted our lives during the coronavirus. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to uh, just respond to a few things that the Democrat leader had just mentioned because he had, uh, again, pointed out that um, the uh, Republican Senate isn't doing work here. Um, hard to fathom how he can possibly come to that conclusion. The Democrat run a House of Representatives is out of session for the entire month, the entire month of June. They're not even here. The Democrat House of Representatives isn't even in town. The Senate is here doing work, and important work, I might add. And he said we hadn't passed any legislation. Well, uh, you know, the week before the Memorial Day break, we passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act reauthorization, a critical piece of national security and intelligence legislation that all our intelligence experts tell us is critical to fighting the war against terrorists. Pretty important uh, legislation, I would say. And he pointed out that the agenda for the month of June um, doesn't include much. Well, uh, that's only if you don't think that the National Defense Authorization Act is not important. Funding the military, authorizing the weapon systems, paying the personnel, the technology, the intelligence, all the things that go into protecting the country seem to me to be pretty important. So the National Defense Authorization Act is a piece of legislation that the Senate will process uh, during the upcoming weeks here in the month of June. In fact, that will probably take a, a good week to move across the floor of the Senate. It typically does. It's something that we have to do on an annual basis, but there's nothing more important or more critical to the national security of the United States than the National Defense Authorization Act. We're going to be passing a major parks bill this next week, which will help uh, fund the backlog in a lot of our national parks, something that's been a priority for many Democrats here in this chamber for a long time. In fact, it's a very bipartisan bill. In fact, I think out of the Democrat caucus, there are somewhere on the order of 43 of the 47 Democrats who are co-sponsoring the piece of legislation that will be called up later this week and be on the floor most of next week. So something that's been around here for a while. It's going to be a major uh, legislative accomplishment. It'll be a bipartisan accomplishment uh, when it passes. And so, Madam President, I would just say that the, the fact that the, the Democrat leader, we aren't doing the things that he wants to do, um, doesn't mean the Senate isn't very busy. And the things that he wants to do, the things that he talks about wanting to do, are things that we're doing. We're dealing with the coronavirus on a daily basis around here. I'm a member of the Senate Finance Committee. Yesterday, the Senate Finance Committee had a hearing in which uh, uh, officials from uh, the FDA, for example, critical uh, agencies when it comes to particularly pharmaceuticals in this country, and the purpose of the, the subject of the hearing was the pharmaceutical supply chain and what we need to do to shore that up to make sure that in future pandemics, uh, and lessons learned from this one, we aren't dependent upon unreliable supply chains in places around the world that, frankly, may not be dependable. Uh, that's a pretty important issue when it comes to dealing with the effects and the impacts of the coronavirus. Uh, today, in the Senate Commerce Committee, another committee on which I serve, uh, we're going to be examining the impact of the coronavirus on our transportation infrastructure and how important uh, these transportation, this transportation has been throughout the course of the coronavirus in ensuring that we keep commerce going, that we keep people, we keep food in the grocery stores. I'm uh, going to be looking at both uh, the highway aspect, the rail aspect, um, all those, and how they are impacted by the coronavirus and what we might need to do uh, to ensure that uh, they continue to be able to provide the services that they do uh, going forward. And so, Madam President, we are consistently looking at, uh, on a daily basis, the coronavirus, the impact it's having on our economy, the impact it's having on the health in this country, health of people in this country, the health emergency, and putting uh, measures in place that would deal uh, not only with that health emergency, but also with the economic crisis created by it. And in the meantime, we're seeing the economy start to open up again, which I think is a very good thing. And I'm hopeful that we'll see, as the economy opens up, uh, people will get out, consumers will spend, investors will invest. And, um, and we'll see that economy start to grow again, jobs to come back. Uh, obviously, we've got very high unemployment right now, a major concern. Uh, we also have a major unemployment insurance uh, piece of legislation that was moved by this Congress earlier to provide assistance and help for those who, for, through no fault of their own, 
have had to go on unemployment. But, uh, Madam President, to suggest for a moment that we aren't focused on the coronavirus is completely misses the point. And um, to suggest also that we haven't done a lot already. We passed four major pieces of legislation totaling almost $3 trillion. And that's $3 trillion if you don't include the amount of leverage that we gave to the Federal Reserve and the Treasury uh, to extend credit and to create liquidity out there. With the power of that leverage, it's somewhere on the order of more of about $6 trillion in assistance that we have put out there uh, through different um, legislative vehicles to the American people. And so you're seeing that translated into the Paycheck Protection Program, which is keeping people employed, keeping people, keeping jobs in this country, keeping businesses functioning and operating. Been a very successful program. You're seeing it in the form of direct assistance to state and local governments. Uh, $150 billion has been put out there, much of which hasn't been spent. And that's on top of a, a lot of other assistance to state and local governments, which totals somewhere on the order of about $500 billion, almost half a trillion dollars so far, some total, has gone out to state and local governments. And much of that, as I said, is in the pipeline, hasn't been spent yet. Is, you know, it can be used, as the Treasury has pointed out, given the state's flexibility for uh, emergency personnel, first responders, police, all the things that the Senator from New York talked about. Um, that's flexibility that the states have now to be able to meet the needs that they have and to work with their local governments to meet the needs of the local governments. So it's, there's a lot of money in the pipeline, uh, not to mention, of course, uh, first and foremost, the money we put out there for uh, investment in um, therapeutics, in vaccines, in diagnostic uh, testing, and uh, all the money that's gone out to hospitals and nursing home providers, uh, long-term care facilities to help them get through uh, this crisis and in the form of direct assistance. So a lot of money in the pipeline, Madam President, as I said, about 2.9 million, or 2.9, I should say, trillion, uh, that's already been authorized. Um, and I think ab about 40% maybe has been spent. So there's still a lot of assistance going out there. Uh, my friend, the Democratic leader, would just want to put a whole bunch more money out there without knowing what the need is. And I think at a time when we are already uh, running a 21 trillion, now 25 trillion dollar debt that we ought to be very circumspect and pay attention to what's happening in our economy, what the needs are, what we need to keep the economy opening up and responding, what we need, what we continue to need to do to help people who are unemployed, uh, what we continue to need to do to support families in this country who are struggling through this uh, crisis. But we ought to do that based on the need, not just somebody saying, well, let's just, let's just throw a bunch more money out there and uh, hope that it has an impact. Uh, we've done that. We've, we've flooded the zone with dollars. There's a tremendous amount of resources out there right now, again, some of which, in fact, a lot of which has yet to be spent. And it strikes me, at least, that uh, in the eyes of you know, most Americans, uh, they would view it as uh, pretty important that uh, before we spend more tax money, all of which I might add is going to be borrowed money, that we see how what we're, we've done already is working, if it's been effective, and if it's uh, having the desired impact. So <laughs> there is so much uh, going on around here dealing with the coronavirus, it just is uh, completely defies uh, any sort of logic to uh, what the, the uh, Democratic leader suggested was happening here in the Senate. He made one other comment, which I think, I just, I think you have to respond to, because he said, that the Senate is in the process, the Republican Senates are processing right-wing judges that have antipathy for the very civil rights issues that, are, that we're dealing with right now. And I don't know how you can make a statement like that. I don't know how you can ascribe motive or intent to uh, judges. You don't know what the, who these judges are. You know, we've got a judge we're going to be processing here for the D.C. Circuit. It's a pretty important circuit in this country. He's a district judge from Kentucky, and he's been rated as very well qualified by the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association isn't a right-wing group at all. In fact, many on our side think they, they uh, certainly drift the other direction. Yet they've said that this judge is a well-qualified judge. Do you think they'd be saying something like that about a judge who had antipathy? Antipathy? For civil rights? I mean, that's, in, that's just a, a, I would say, a reckless and irresponsible statement, uh, unless you have something to back that up and support it. So, Madam President, um, I just 
thought it'd be important to, uh, to respond to some of the things that the Democratic leader uh, just said with respect to the agenda here in the Senate, which, as I pointed out earlier, is a, a very full one. And if you compare it <laughs> to the agenda of our colleagues in the Democrat-controlled House, which is zilch because they're not here for the entire month, it seems to me the Senate's getting a lot of work done. So, Madam President, what I came here to talk about I came down to the floor a couple of weeks ago to talk about how the coronavirus has highlighted the importance of strong internet networks. Uh, despite the surge that we've seen in internet traffic, coronavirus has produced, with Americans using the internet for everything from work to school to family dinners, U.S. networks that have held up tremendously well. Americans have been able to enjoy the same speed and streaming quality that they typically enjoy, something that hasn't happened in a lot of other countries. And that's a direct result of the United States' light-touch approach to Internet regulation, which has encouraged American companies to invest in the latest communications infrastructure and new technologies to make more efficient use of spectrum. Our nation is currently preparing for the widespread adoption of the next generation of Internet technology, what's known as 5G. We need to make sure that our 5G networks will be strong, as strong, I should say, as our current networks but we still have some work to do to get to that point. Now, I've come down here frequently uh, to the floor to discuss that work, which includes paving the way for the widespread installation of the small cells that are necessary for 5G networks, enhancing the availability of the mid-band spectrum that's necessary for 5G deployment, and investing in a 5G workforce. But there's also another aspect we need to think about when it comes to 5G, which is sometimes not talked about as much, and that is network security. With its incredible speed and connectivity, 5G will usher in a new era of innovation. Advances in medical care, the large-scale deployment of precision agriculture, safer transportation technologies, 5G will bring all of these things, Madam President, and more. But like any new technology, 5G networks will present new risks and vulnerabilities. And because 5G will mean a vastly greater number of connected devices, the risks with 5G will be greater. That's why an essential part of deploying 5G networks has to be looking at how we can mitigate security risks. We need to ensure that our component parts of our devices, and critically the component parts of telecommunications networks like cell towers and the small cells that will be required for 5G, are secure. And a primary way to do that is by ensuring that 5G equipment comes from trusted vendors. Currently, one of the biggest suppliers of 5G equipment worldwide is a Chinese company, Huawei, which is supported by the Chinese government. China's 2017 national intelligence law requires Chinese companies to support the Chinese government's intelligence activities. And American security officials have raised concerns that much of Huawei's equipment is built with back doors that give the Chinese government access to global communications networks. Madam President, I don't need to tell anyone that we should be wary of China's motives and that China's interests are frequently opposed to those of the United States. China's handling of the coronavirus is a striking current example of the Chinese government's prioritizing its own interests or pride over the public good. As the New York Times article noted in February, the Chinese government's initial handling of the epidemic allowed the virus to gain a tenacious hold. At critical moments, officials chose to put secrecy and order ahead of openly confronting the growing crisis to avoid political alarm and political embarrassment, end quote. Well, whether it was driven by the hubris of the Communist Party or merely the callous indifference, the Communist state has for the well-being of its own citizens. China was not transparent about the grave danger of COVID-19. It failed to release accurate information about the nature and spread of the virus, and it took active steps to make sure the truth did not get out in other ways. Whistleblowers were punished, dissenters were censored, and journalists were expelled. And despite the fact that its negligence undoubtedly contributed to the global spread of COVID-19, China still, still continues to be less than forthcoming about the virus. Unfortunately, this is run-of-the-mill governing in China, as we saw with the SARS outbreak in the early 2000s, and as we have seen in many other instances. And not content with its role in aggravating the spread of the coronavirus, the Chinese Communist Party has also taken advantage of the pandemic to strip Hong Kong of its autonomy and freedom. China's hope is that our nation is too preoccupied with this pandemic to notice its efforts to undermine what should be Hong Kong's autonomy under the one state, two systems construct. And Mr. President, we have noticed. 
And as many of my colleagues and I have expressed, we stand with Hong Kong. And we must carefully consider an appropriate response, one that will rebuke the Communist Party of China without negatively affecting the people of Hong Kong, their well-being, and their democratic aspirations. Mr. President, we didn't need COVID-19 or China's recent actions in Hong Kong to know that giving the Chinese government a backdoor into American communications networks is a bad idea. But it certainly underscores the need to make sure that 5G infrastructure is not made by companies beholden to the Chinese government. The United States has taken a number of steps to prevent equipment from Huawei and other suspect Chinese, another uh, suspect Chinese company, ZTE, from being used in U.S. communications networks. But these companies still pose a risk to the United States. For starters, some U.S. broadband providers, often in rural areas, still have equipment from Huawei and ZTE in their communications networks. And a number of our allies and trade partners, entities with whom we regularly share information, including sensitive national security information, have used or are using technology from Huawei and ZTE. So what can we do? Well, an initiative is already underway to replace suspect telecommunications components in U.S. networks with hardware from trusted companies. In March, the President signed the legislation developed by Commerce Committee Chairman Roger Wicker, the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act, to help speed up this process. This legislation, which I co-sponsored, will help small telecommunications providers with the cost of replacing network components that pose a security risk. Also in March, I introduced legislation to help address the other part of the problem, and that's the use of Huawei technology by our allies and our trading partners. We reg regularly exchange information, including sensitive national security information, with our allies and trading partners, and this information can only be secure, can only be secure if networks on both ends are secure. And that's why the U.S. has called for other countries to reject telecommunications technology from Huawei and ZTE. A number of countries have committed to using trusted companies to build out their telecommunications networks, but other countries are still planning to make use of Huawei's technology. My legislation, the Network Security Trade Act, would make telecommunications security a key objective when negotiating future trade deals. We should be using trade agreements to push for enhanced network security globally, which would benefit not only our country, but every country with which we do business. We recently opened negotiations on a new trade deal with the United Kingdom, which has been using Huawei technology to build its 5G networks. I'm pleased that it now looks like the UK is reconsidering its use of Huawei components. I hope they'll decide to reject this suspect technology. And I hope that trade negotiations will emphasize the importance of using trusted companies to build out the UK's telecommunications networks, the security, of our communications with our trading partners and allies, particularly those allies like Britain, needs to be a priority. Mr. President, as we move forward into the 5G future, we need to make sure that our technological advancements are matched with advancements in network security. And that starts with keeping Huawei and other suspect technology out of our networks, and if at all possible, out of networks, out of the networks of our allies. I will continue to do everything I can to ensure that we have not only the infrastructure, but the security needed to keep American networks at the forefront of the telecommunications revolution. Mr. President, before I close, let me just say one more word about China. As I said earlier, China's coronavirus deception is undoubtedly partly responsible for the fact this virus has now spread to every corner of the world. And China's recent actions with regard to Hong Kong underscore the hostility of the Chinese government to the values that freedom-loving countries hold dear. China has a lot of work to do if it ever hopes to rebuild trust with other nations. At a bare minimum, we expect China to uphold its recent trade commitments, which are critical to America's hard-hit farmers and ranchers. I will be looking, and our entire government will be looking, to see if China's words on trade agreements can be relied upon. I hope, Mr. President, that the Chinese government will live up to its commitments. I yield the floor.